Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. One of the most endangered parts of the ship, and one of the things that I've been most scared to see out of the water, is the ship's wind water line. The water line, or wind water line, is the area of the hull where normally you see the most wave action. Obviously, a water level is not perfectly smooth, and so there isn't a clean break between what's always wet and what's always dry. Systems of coatings tend to perform best if they are either always dry or always wet. But if they are constantly wetting and drying, expanding, contracting, wetting, drying, uh, getting exposed to the air, and then blocked from the air, that wears off and corrodes much, much quicker than other parts of the ship. It's also a transition point between the really good system of coatings that would be applied underwater and the more cosmetic system of coatings that's applied above water. A further area of concern is that as a museum, Battleship New Jersey and the other Iowa-class battleships, I imagine, don't sit at their optimal water line. Because they are significantly lighter loaded than they would be in service, about 45,000 tons total for New Jersey, she she sits in the water very differently than normal. Her stern draws about 34 feet of water, amidships it's about 30 feet, and at the bow it's about 24 feet of water, much, much shallower than expected. Optimally, she would draw about 36 feet aft and about 34 feet forward. These ships have optimum water lines specifically to keep their armor in the right place. Different types of warheads require different armor to protect against it. For projectiles, you want something that is dense, solid, and even a little bit brittle to outright reject that warhead, make it bounce off. However, for things like mines and torpedoes, big explosions, you want something that's thin and elastic and is going to crumple and absorb that explosion as opposed to trying to be rigid and resistant. When it's rigid and resists, it will shatter or it will break along a seam, causing significant damage. For example, during the attack on Pearl Harbor, West Virginia was overloaded and torpedo hits on her hit near the armored belt. Look at how this riveted seam ripped open, flooding several compartments inside the ship. Iowa-class battleships are designed with that in mind. With an armored belt that's approximately one deck high above the water that then starts to taper thinner below the water. Below the water there are also additional bulkheads and liquid loaded spaces to help absorb the impact and explosion of the types of warheads normally hitting underwater. Things like mines and torpedoes. And while it's important for the armored belt to go below the water to protect against plunging shells, the water is going to slow those shells down significantly, and so it's okay that the belt has become thinner and more elastic at that layer. Knowing that the ships had optimal loading conditions meant that the Navy tended to keep the ships optimally loaded in service. However, with things like fuel, feed water, food, consumables, ammunition, all removed from the ship, she sits in a kind of unnatural way, down by the stern because of the amount of weight back there and up by the bow. This puts the very thinnest plate on the entire ship right at the wind water line. Normally there's a band of plate that's thicker that sits at the normal water line, as opposed to right now where our thinnest plate, about 7 sixteenths of an inch thick or just below a half inch thick, is what's on the wind water line. So that concerns the museum considerably. We've seen significant corrosion on battleships in salt water in this area, especially warm salt water. And one of the reasons Missouri went into dry dock in 2009 was a leak in her peak tank in that area. Ships like North Carolina and Iowa are doing tremendous work treating these areas with coffer dams. Iowa with a movable coffer dam that they're using to focus on that endangered area and North Carolina with a coffer dam built entirely around the ship where they were able to crop out and replace all of the plating at the bow. 
Since we're in fresh water, we knew our wind water line was going to be in better condition, but we couldn't guarantee how much better of a condition it would be. It's been 15 years since Missouri was developed that leak and had to be dry docked. We weren't sure that uh, we were gonna last much longer. It has been a huge relief for me seeing the ship in dry dock and seeing the condition of the ship. We're roughly at uh, frame 165 right now, below turret number three. So the plating here at the wind water line is 60 pound STS, or inch and a half thick armor plate. It's the thickest plating on the entire water line. However, you can see that there's no corrosion, but over in this area near this riveted seam, you can see that the top coat has worn away, and that's because we've got one of our fenders that rubs up against that area. It's one of the soft collapsible things that protects the ship from bouncing into the brick pier but it always sits there and so it has caused a little bit of uh, paint removal over time but even so it looks like it hasn't gotten below the primer underneath just because our wind water line is in fantastic condition now doesn't mean we aren't going to do some extra work to it while we're here in dry dock our plan is to go about three feet above our normal water line for the entire length of the ship when we're painting that's more than enough for the small waves we see on the Delaware River. In addition to the system of coatings that we put on the hull uh, for the regular underwater hull that's three layers of paint thick or 30 mils thick, if you don't understand what any of that is, there's a link in the description below to a video we released last night about the paint we're putting on. We're also gonna put two additional coats along the wind water line. So that'll be about three feet above the water line and about three feet below the water line. And again, these coats are gonna be in different colors than the coats below so that we can see as they're worn away over time. Our initial survey of the hull showed that we need to do no hot work along the wind water line. But later this week, we're gonna start doing ultrasonic tests of the hull to see if the plate thickness is still as thick as it's supposed to be. That may modify that. However, based on what we're seeing, we don't expect to have any issues though we are going to definitely concentrate the 5,000 UT shots around the most vulnerable areas, such as the wind water line, especially at the bow and the stern where it's thinnest. What's a part of the ship that you would think would be more endangered than the rest after 30 years between dry dockings? Let us know in the comments section down below. We may shoot a future video about it. Be sure to come out and see the battleship while she's out of the water in April and May 2024. There's a link in the description below to how you can get tickets. Remember, there are less than 5,000 tickets in total available. Be sure you're one of the 5,000 people that gets to see Battleship New Jersey out of the water. Battleship New Jersey receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State, also from a number of other businesses and private individuals like yourselves. We really appreciate your support. There's a link in the description below for ways you can donate to support the museum and our ongoing restoration work. You can also support us by liking, sharing, and subscribing so more people find out about the museum and our channel. Thanks for watching.